Very good. All right. Cool. Nice background, Lexi. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a weather caster. <laughs> Very nice. Alright, it is 5.30. So, since it's 5.30 and we've mailed 3,000 postcards to people inviting them to join us at, to our meeting at this time, why don't we get started with introductions? So, I'm Alan Lamberg, Senior Planner for the City of Pueblo Planning and Community Development Department. Uh, Laura Mankiewicz, uh, Planner for City of Pueblo, same. Um, and let's, uh, uh, Lexi, want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lexi Romero. I work over at the health department. Um, I work on a built environment grant that uh, works in the Superfund neighborhoods. So trying to get neighborhood improvements and other stuff within the neighborhood. Thank you, Lexi. And, and, and Lexi's also the key facilitator on several neighborhood organizations such as BAN and, and BEGIN. BEGIN stands for uh, Bessemer Hilers Grove Improvement Network. So we couldn't do with that. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you. Um, and, and down the line, um, I see uh, Rick Romero has joined us. Want to yes, introduce sir. yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Rick Romero. I'm a resident of Bojan Town. I'm also a Begin member, a CAG member, and I'm just involved with the revitalization pro process. Great. Uh, Paul Renfrey. Uh, yeah, Paul Renfrey from the Grove. Um, property owner and resident in the Grove working with Lexi and uh, the EPA on the CAG and city on the uh, revitalization. And I see Renee from NeighborWorks. Hello, yep, Renee from NeighborWorks. I work under the same grant that Lexi does, um, trying to get our community, you know, better and up and running and just moving forward. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Mr. John Lewis, would you like to introduce yourself? Maybe, maybe later. <laughs> um, is, is, is anyone else in the call that we haven't uh, introduced yet? Please go I, ahead and introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Who's that? Who's who's speaking? My name is Abby Algeen. I'm a resident here in the Grove um, at the corner of D Street and the cul-de-sac of Clark. And I'm a I'm definitely interested in the revitalization plan. Oh, great. How do you spell your last name, Miss Abby? It's A L G I E N E. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miss Algie. Is anyone else on the on the call that hasn't introduced themselves? All right. And I do recognize there's a John Lewis with us on the call, and um, we'll definitely, uh, if if you prefer to wait until comments later, you can introduce yourself then. Uh, but we'll, we're going to just go ahead and get started and. and and uh, introduce the plan. Um, Bart's going to go through the slideshow with me, and I'll just really briefly give us some broad strokes about this plan. Um, so the area of interest is the Superfund revitalization uh, area, which encompasses these three neighborhoods, uh, Islas and Bojan Town, The Grove, and Bessemer, uh, along with south of that, uh, south of Northern Avenue, uh, Everaz Rocky Mountain Steel and other areas uh, south of Bessemer. Um, the, the area of Bessemer and Bojan Town pretty much was previously compiled into a neighborhood plan about 15 years ago. So um, there's a lot of strategies that have been since adopted or implemented. About half of those strategies were adopted or implemented. Uh, so this plan is a good opportunity to reassess what's going on on the ground now. And to, and to leverage what's going on with the Superfund site um, and, and to find out ways we can <clears throat> get some strategies that can improve the neighborhoods. Uh, it, back in, um, when the Superfund site area was designated in 2015, uh, there was a community visioning workshop in 2016 that got the conversation really going on some ideas. In 2017, there was a, 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 like a technical assistance workshop called the Building Blocks for equitable development. Some, many of you might re remember that where we did some tours around the neighborhood and then 
we worked with some consultants, and they helped us outline three goals and several strategies there. And then followed by a lot of that got incorporated into a, uh, a visioning workshop that the EPA helped us lead uh, in 2018 of October. Um, from that workshop, which invited key stakeholders, a lot of agencies and citizens who would wind up implementing these things, uh, they're the ones that gave a lot of input, which went into this plan as you see. Um, when that plan was drafted in July of 2019, uh, then we took that plan, and, and BART especially was integral in that, talking with the other agencies and saying, okay, here's this current draft. Uh, let's, of these strategies, uh, are they actionable, you know, for the agencies that would implement them? So that's where we got some feedback from them to kind of clarify and um, improve how we word those strategies so they are indeed actionable, doable. Um, and... Uh, and so that's what you see today with the plan that's available online. And they, they come in three themes, and we'll go over those themes briefly on the next slide, please. Uh, the, next, the next slide does show one. The reason for the next, this slide mm -hmm. is um, this shows the uh, daily traffic volume for the area. And the reason we included mm -hmm. this slide is in planning we call <clears throat> these high traffic areas barriers mm -hmm. because you can't just... Uh, one, it's either a safety issue walking across those, or it's um, it's actually just not possible to cross it, such as highway, mm. without some sort of um, bridge. <clears throat> so what we have in this area is several barriers that that separate these into different communities, including the river, and that was it's just important for the for the context of these strategies. Thank you, Bart. Yep. So one of the th uh, one of the three themes is connect called connectivity and cultural heritage, and for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to be broad strokes, um, just to get keep people acquainted with these themes if they're not already, and then we can really drill down as part of the discussion later on. Um, but the connectivity and cultural heritage has a lot to do with uh, identifying um, trailways, uh, connecting the, the neighborhoods with trails, improving. Um, streets and, and, and bikeways, and um, also talking about heritage, uh, one of the more successful <coughs> initiatives uh, that we've seen lately is, is we've seen a work group get together uh, and, de and start developing an idea of a history trail that would run from the Riverwalk down Santa Fe and cutting over by Dewdrop Inn to Mesa and then across the bridge to Bessemer and then maybe down to Elm and then the Northern Avenue or further south to uh, the Steelworks Museum. So uh, it's really about just what can we do, what physical improvements to the neighborhoods can bring these, two neighbor these three neighborhoods together, mm -hmm. and also to kind of in increase their self-identity <clears throat> and, uh, and their heritage so, they, so that way it not just improve their quality of life, but also do things that get them out and, in and enjoy um, their neighborhoods, whether it's just going for a walk uh, or, or shopping in their commercial districts. Um, so in the, I believe the second map corresponds with uh, mm. with the, the uh, I'll go back so you see. These first items up here are, are identified in this map. Ah, yes. So, that, so there is a map that we're looking at. And for those of you who don't have video, uh, again, don't worry, because all this will be available online on a YouTube video later on. But... Um, and I'll keep it brief. So we were looking at a map that, that identifies commercial corridors along Santa Fe, Northern Avenue, and Evans, and then a residential corridor along Mesa. And then and there's a lot of uh, points that show existing businesses. And um, so that just, that's a good way to kind of get a framework for where we can make improvements, such as signage, wayfinding, bike paths, um, and uh, heritage-type activities. Mm -hmm. And those... Um the character of the streets, uh, so the pink would be a commercial corridor and the blue would be a residential. And that affects us how we do the streetscape and how we look at the pedestrian and vehicle, motor vehicle interactions. Whereas with a commercial corridor, uh, the philosophy coming out of the planning department is to not try and put bicycles on the road with motorists, especially when you're talking about 30 and 45 mile an hour roads. So then we want to provide them wider sidewalks and 
uh, off-street uh, facilities. Whereas with a residential corridor, we want to be more um, uh, pedestrian friendly or at least bicycle friendly with the sharing the road policy and giving them uh, adequate space to uh, get around. The idea is that the cyclist will um, know the difference between a residential corridor and a commercial corridor and know that they're going to be safer and um, able to get around to the same places by not going on to northern, whereas they could go off the street off. Like Mesa, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, um, and I would be remiss to not mention up in the Grove, there's Spring Street, which is a nice residential corridor. And so when people are traveling from the Riverwalk, um, instead of just going straight along Santa Fe, which they could do that, but why not do a little detour into the Grove along Spring Street, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the, the you know, the, the cute houses there, and then some of the interesting, like the art studios and such, and then circle back onto Santa Fe. So that's well, yeah, true, and to access the new uh, levee trail. Right. Yes. Thank you for mentioning yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, is the levee trail talked about in which theme, do you recall? Uh, this, this next one. The next one. Okay, great. Good segue, Bart. Yes. So let's do a segue. Well, no, not that we, mm -hmm. the, see, the maps, are, and it's important to realize, the maps are more corresponding with the first theme. So we have two maps for the first theme. The other ones are more conceptual ideas and there's yeah. less, less maps. So the second map here mm. identifies, and uh, so these are our existing and proposed bike trails. Mm -hmm. And by overlaying them, you can see how they would interact and, and connect in the future. Um, then we just identify the locations um, of these projects. Right. And that is part two. I okay. could probably go through, but if you want to talk about it, I, I think just... Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll drill down in those specific mm -hmm. uh, strategies uh, after we do the presentation. Okay. Uh, too, because we want to really drill down with the, the people present on the call, okay. their direct questions. Um, and so so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay. This is the history trail. Yep. And uh, and also the, the, the one that's for... Um, uh, with the flag, multi-use. Uh, uh, rock utility. Or, but, oh, sorry, last one. The identify potential sites for public spaces. Mm. Uh, so uh, just to put an actual mm -hmm. identified area, uh, we, we added the Steelworks Museum, uh, or the, um, what is the name of that parking lot? Does that have a specific name? Um, Yes, it's the parking lot that serves the steel Steelworks Museum. Museum. Yeah. And, and uh, it was called out as the, in the Bessemer Plan in 2004, mm -hmm. the Bessemer Plaza idea. And, uh, and with the activity going on at Water Tower Place mm -hmm. or the Ice House or the Alpha Beta Building or which, whichever inclination you want to call it, you know, they are trying to focus a lot on the Grove community and providing outdoor spaces uh, in that area as well. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on to... Um, We'll move on to uh, thriving neighborhoods. And I'm sure some of you already have some ideas and questions about this first theme, but we'll definitely just, again, broad strokes first, then we'll circle back. Um, so thriving neighborhoods is about um, primarily increasing um, residential character, maintaining residential character, uh, uh, incentivizing home ownership, um, and also mitigating any, you know, impacts from from the increase of rental properties, mm -hmm. um, also amending our zoning code any, any way we can to and continue to amend our zoning code to make it easier to redevelop in these smaller lot areas. And, and also repair, you know, what can we do to repair and maintain streets and sidewalks? Um, what, maybe there's a map as well. As, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So, um, so for, Bart, do you want to... Give context to that map on the right side. Uh, yeah, the, this actually came out in the later stages. Uh, I, I believe. Well, the truth is that this has come from a city councilman wanted to make sure that the uh, I-25 corridor that's on the right mm. uh, it, it was uh, taken in consideration in this plan. Um, I guess the quick way you could see it is there's a five-minute commercial of Pueblo every time someone drives through Pueblo and you know what that um, what that impression is is some is sometimes the only thing that people know about Pueblo so uh, what you see on the map is there some of you know there is an existing 
sort of retaining uh, aesthetic sound wall, uh, that would be over here. Um, and but uh, the blue and the green represent, and I guess my I got some stuff on my screen, so it's a little bit. Let me just move this over a little bit. Oh, a buffer. Yeah. Uh, so the blue, the difference here, the blue line would indicate where we're trying to shield the residences from the highway and vice versa um, to provide a kind of a sense of more of a sense of place than I live right next to the highway um, for the for those individual residents. Whereas the green is a little different because as we're going through the Steelworks Museum, that's something we kind of want to showcase. Um, and that would be less of an opaque uh, barrier and more maybe just a nicer fence along that section or something. Aesthetic. Yeah, something yeah. a little bit uh, more aesthetic. Yeah, because when you drive by, you can see the Steelworks Park with the artifacts of the Steel Museum. That's yeah. a great visual. Yeah, thing. especially as these plans develop and as that area is beautified, you don't want to cover it up. Yeah. You know. All right. So we move on to the next item. Yeah. And so, and they, and and one more point about the, uh, res uh, the, the second theme. It's all about placemaking. I don't know if some of you may have heard the term placemaking, but um, that's kind of a buzzword you might want to consider too. It's just um, being being in a place and, and experiencing its unique identity uh, and being connected to that identity. Um, that's kind of what we mean by placemaking. Uh, as for theme number three, vibrant commercial, helping the economy, you know, there, we've got, basically it's about supporting local businesses, especially small businesses, uh, in, encouraging them to get more involved in their merchants associations or chambers of commerce or taking advantage of the services yeah. that are available to them so they, they can uh, become even more successful and to retain them in the neighborhood and to maybe introduce new businesses. Um, there's lots of different programs that we could focus on, so it's just a matter of getting that, getting that, setting that direction, setting that course for them. Um, also supporting uh, neighborhood neighborhood co-ops, whether it's food co-ops or local serving markets or other types of cooperatives um, that in, that involves the residences and the people who live there, um, and also just making sure that it's a more walkable, active commercial corridors. When it got some other exhibit for us? Uh, no, nope. we get into where the resources sure. are. Sure. Okay. But yeah, so a lot of the other maps that we show kind of also indirectly relate to that too. I can go back to any of those. Yeah. If you want to. Like going, just thinking in that in terms of commercial corridor again to remind you, it's Northern Avenue and Santa Fe and uh, Evans are, are very important commercial corridors. Um, so when we talk about the third theme, the the area of focus is in those corridors. Um, and we would hope that as those cor corridors improve, then there's a, an effect that spills over into the adjacent areas. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the, there's some resources available. And so those, for those who aren't familiar, the plan can be found on our city website, pueblo.us forward slash CSRP. That stands for Colorado Smelter Revitalization Plan, CSRP. So that's, it takes you to a page and it just briefly explains what's going on and the document, you click on that, there's a PDF, plans with how many pages, 12? Yeah, it's not very long. Yeah, full color plan, a lot of thought's been put into it, so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a good resource for people to read, whether you're a citizen, business owner, resident, mm -hmm. um, and we want to hear your feedback, that's the whole point of this. And one of those ways to get feedback is to fill out a survey, uh, which Bart was able to took the plan strategies and prepared a survey. Or you want to explain how that survey works or the intent? Yeah, sure. Um, so <coughs> we have it on the screen on the yeah. browser too. So I'm just going to go back a little bit. So each of these themes, um, they're, they're connected to an idea or a, a plan or a program. So what we're doing with the survey is we're trying to prioritize to get the community, well first it's important the community came up with a lot of these plans but now the community has to prioritize these plans because of funding constraints, so just to be blunt. So, you know, without <laughs> us knowing what the top priorities are, uh, uh, you know, to best serve the community, it's best to know what their top priorities are. Mm -hmm. So through a survey which turns uh, priorities into data uh, that we can evaluate by um, giving it a point system, essentially. So. Uh, 
Uh, it, it has been brought up, it, what if someone marks everything's a top priority, then it, 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 they just kind of neutralize their data and, you know, just gives weight to the other, uh, the people who didn't do that, essentially. Thanks, Bart. And the other thing is, the other important thing is whether you're taking the survey or giving us open comments or I, new ideas or, or saying, hey, some of these ideas don't work so well or any comments, it's important that you, to share that. But also keep in mind that um, it's, it's bigger than each of us. You know, this, the, in the long term, we want to see something that will serve the community as a whole um, and that, you know, that we want to think about who are the um, who are the people that will be using these improvements in the future? Um, wh what's their demographics going to be like? Um, are they going to be younger, older? You know, because um, if if you think about who's going to be using these improvements in the future, and I'm talking maybe five, ten, thirty, or even fifty years from now, then if you if you keep that in mind and you use that wisdom, then that also helps give weight when, 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 this, when projects are being evaluated for, you know, for funding, uh, then that also, that helps, uh, that, that they, they consider these things, you know, and among other factors. And another factor that they consider when they give weight, when I say they, I mean like the city council or the directors of the city that, for a capital improvement plan, you know, or, or grant funders that are federal or state or local, um, you know, community development block grants, all that stuff, um, they give weight to things that are going to have the most Im immediate impact, positive effect um, for, the, for the populations that it's meant to serve. And, uh, but here's another beautiful thing about this plan is that if we really go through this process and get the ver very good feedback from the public and then we revise this plan, then we pass it to the Planning and Zoning Commission of, uh, who then make a report and recommendation to the city council and then the city council would upon recommendation of the planning and zoning commission city council would adopt this formally adopt this plan uh, and doing so gives it greater weight for future funding for uh, projects um, um, yeah sure. so um, that's that's our and in a nutshell in 20 minutes we did our best to encapsulate it but but now we, I would like to open the forum to the folks on the call and Share your thoughts, and so let's 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 go to gallery view if we can, just so I can yep. see who's, who's. And I can. Um, there you go. Oh, great, great. Thank you. All right. So um, so I'm just I'm just gonna go ran by random order. Uh, looks uh, from the top from what we can see. So I'm just gonna call on people since we got. So Rick, you got some initial thoughts? So I know you've been engaged with us a lot, but what's on what's on your mind tonight? Well, one of the things, Ellen, I've been involved since the, you know, before the 2016, but I did go to the 2016, and that's kind of when I started talking about some of the ideas of the neighborhoods connecting and stuff like that, and then went to the 2017 building blocks and the 2018 visioning. And I never recall through that whole process anything being talked about the interstate wall for the Stillworks, you know, new museum that you guys are talking about. And I understand that that's going to be the way the city councilman that I'm, I, I know you're referring to, he wants to go probably from, from uh, Pueblo Boulevard coming into town toward the Rio Grande area there, that Rio Grande Street. And kind of the thing that I've always had an issue with that is I had actually heard, I've actually heard someone say it, that one of the reasonings they want to kind of put that on the interstate is to actually hide some of that neighborhood area in the Rio Grande area where the Bojan town area is. And to me, the whole thing with the process of the revitalization isn't to hide our neighborhoods. We're wanting to revitalize and bring Rio Grande back up to where it's a beautiful area again. We're not wanting to cover something up. Uh, and I understand the part over where the steel worker uh, part would be on the Rio Grande. You know, that's a nice area there. Uh, but to hide the, the, it would be the east end of the interstate and also the Rio Grande area, there's been a lot of rumor that that's just been wanting to be covered up so people that come in through the South don't see that area down in there where the behind Benedict Park and all that area. And I kind of, like I said, I, that was never brought up in any of the 2060 meetings, but I noticed on the survey that that actually was in, 
put in there somehow. I didn't know how that got involved. Um, I guess that's kind of what I'm wondering about. Okay, that's fair. That's fair, Rick. So I, your statement is don't hide our neighborhoods, especially the residential neighborhoods. With the, with yeah, the not with the wall. Area. That was The opposite thing is when I, we're talking about the Muriel Wall on East Northern Avenue, that's to beautify the neighborhood and bring the neighborhood back up so we can promote businesses. And people uh, need to understand how much volume of, of goes through East Northern where that a Muriel Wall there would be, I mean, that'd be awesome looking. But it's not going to hide our, that neighborhood. It's actually going to hopefully bring in and redevelop and start East Northern and West Northern back up by by putting such a nice uh, honoring the CFNI workers on East Northern. So to me, I didn't want my whole thing is I didn't want to hide the neighborhoods. And I, I view revitalization is uh, we had bad areas or disrepaired areas. We're bringing those back up. We're not going to cover them up. Uh, so I guess that's my point of view on that, the two differences of the of the two walls. And I know what city council member you're talking about who wants that. Uh, but like I said, I just have a different view of, of the two projects. That's good. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we'll circle back to you later in the call, just in case you got some more ideas. Um, okay. Kind of thing, but why don't we talk to, open the floor to anyone who hasn't, we haven't talked with much. Um, Mr. Lewis, do you have any, John Lewis, do you have anything uh, you'd like to share at this time? It, see, it looks like you have a microphone, but I'm not sure if your audio is connected. He, Mr. Lewis, he, he can manually have muted himself. Not this. Yeah. Well, Mr. Lewis, if, if you can, uh, type in the chat box, too, with your questions, so that way we can, there, I mean, if you click on chat uh, and they'll bring up chat box, you can send your question via there, too. Um, I, have a, I have a point of interest, please. Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Abby, please. Okay. Um, the the cul-de-sac or the current revitalization along the new uh, entrance to Runyon Field, the freeway and everything. I currently live next to the cul-de-sac along D Street and then of course the Street of Park. I am the one that cleans that cul-de-sac of trash. Mm. And also it, it still needs uh, some current upgrading on the ground coverage. You know, you can see plastic coming through the underlayment. Uh, uh, you know, um, and uh, the streets in the Grove definitely need to be repaved. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Uh, and then I just called um, the the newspaper. I'm I'm getting ready to call the the chiefs of police and the sheriff. The traffic on Santa Fe, eight miles an hour, eighty five. They race each other. We need a light right there at that new, at that new corner right there um, of the new um, freeway entrance. Because once they clear that that light by um, um, beginning of Sonic, they will speed all the way to Center Drive. I see, yeah, especially since people are trying to exit on from Spring Street, it's it can be pretty treacherous. It seems. Yep. I, I personally think so when I enter in and out of there. Lexi's got a hand up. Oh, yeah, Lexi. Well, thank you, Ms. Abby. We might circle back later in the call, too, but I've, I've taken some notes there. Le okay. Lexi, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things. So one, there was a comment. I, I'm just taking a look at the chat for you guys since you guys are facilitating. One thing is um, just a suggestion. If you guys stop sharing, then we can see everybody in the gallery. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the Sorry. second and the second thing is um, John Lewis mentioned good presentation. Um, I would suggest that the plan include a facade improvement components for the commercial. So facade, or I don't think, never mind. I don't think I'm saying that correctly. Oh yeah, easements and then tax credits are possible. Existing sidewalk and street resurfacing must be done and part of the plan as well. So working on improvements for the commercial, working on tax credits if that's possible, as well as easements and then sidewalk and street resurfacing mm -hmm. are all ideas too. When you say tax credits, can you be more specific? Just uh, easements and right there. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you were reading. You're reading, Mr. Yeah, I'm just reading. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for reading out loud, Mr. Lewis's comments. And Mr. Lewis, I'm assuming you mean by easements, because I've heard of programs which I, I would wholly support, where the um, the city actually takes ownership of 
simply the facade of the building to make sure that it's up to standard. Uh, is that what you're referring to? Or just uh, money to help that? Okay, yeah. Yes, okay. that is not a bad idea. Good, cool, cool. I don't, uh, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I'm getting a new opinion here and I, I'm doing so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, some city, yeah, some cities have facade improvement programs, uh, and that's what Bart was uh, mentioning, is that um, we don't have this in Pueblo at this time, but, but it, that it would involve a, um, an easement, yeah, where uh, um, a business owner or a property owner would, would, would participate in a program and that the city or an, or an authority would, would be responsible for, and then they would in exchange for some financing or financial support or maybe some loans would be able to make the improvements to the facade and then the city would have an easement that effectively um, just like any easement um, even though the city is not the owner of the facade because it's still the property owner's property but the easement controls for maintenance and requires future maintenance of that facade and just for everyone that that's all Sorry, and I know you guys haven't always gotten to see me. I'm Ashley Winans. I'm the CEO at NeighborWorks, but we actually do have a facade improvement program in the city. It is through our urban renewal department, uh, the urban renewal authority. We need to make Northern Avenue uh, and, and possibly some of these other areas a district with urban renewal. And then they actually have a facade improvement um, piece. And so they can do those loans and they can be a part of that. I'm just saying that that, that might be a much easier pathway um, because they already have all of those policies and all of those things set up. Um, we just need to add more districts to what they're already doing. And Northern and, and some of the other little smaller areas that you guys have um, identified and calling it like a Northern area district probably would be the easiest pathway. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, I am, um, to be honest, I, I also heard that Urban Renewal, Pueblo Urban Renewal Authority it, it definitely had this program at one time, but I was under the, I heard or I was under the impression that it, they no longer do it. But with that said, I'm making notes here to investigate that point and just talk to, uh, you know, Jerry. From my best understanding, they still have the funds. They yeah. just haven't been able to release them. It does have to make financial sense. And they are going through a process of figuring some of that out. Um, okay. The majority of the funds that they had allocated were on um, fourth on the east side and they've been having trouble making sense of those proposals sure yeah so it's just a matter of working some things out but it'll be worth a follow-up conversation with urban renewal for sure yeah and uh just for context for everyone um and just the theory behind the the easement for facades or something like that is that in those commercial corridors the value of the property and how it affects your neighbors is exponentially more important to how we uh, in residential how we do it the same way where you can't negatively affect your neighbors so one way to directly affect that is to say don't worry about it. we're going to make sure the front of your building and the windows aren't broken and it looks up to snuff yeah very proactive move i'm, I'm i have no idea if, if Pueblo would be behind such grandiose things but i think it's great yeah um and uh Okay, so uh, uh, Paul, let's give Paul a chance to weigh in here. Uh, yeah, I think you guys have hit a lot of the points that everybody's been talking about. And um, I think that the plan looks like it's coming together really nicely. Um, and just to follow up on the other Grove residents' um, concerns with the traffic on Santa Fe, I think that's something that really needs to be addressed because the traffic is. Uh, real problem there. I mean, you're talking about putting a history walk along Santa Fe or something like that. And I think it needs to be seriously considered. 
Um, you know, along with that, I'm hoping that, you know, that South Santa Fe area from Water Tower Place up to um, the uh, I-25 area is part of a streetscape plan so that that area too will get some sort of attention mm -hmm. and maybe some traffic mitigation features incorporated into the streetscaping that we're thinking about doing there. Uh, so we could slow that down. You know, we, there is um, a kid was killed on his motorcycle right there at Allen Hamill Drive and South Santa Fe like a week ago. And these kids have been using South Santa Fe there for their for these cross rockets to go really, really fast That's up and right. down there. You can hear them all night long going up and down and during the day as well. And it's a real problem. These guys have they used that taken over that area to kind of race their bikes and stuff. Um, this is just a group question, even um, maybe just raise your hand um, if you agree, don't raise your hand if you disagree. Is the traffic that intense that you would need a, <clears throat> would it be light or would it be a pedestrian walkover? Do you think people would use that from, I think to we connect need a light. the two sides of the grove? We need a light at, okay. at, at uh, D Street. I think lights and uh, are useful too because it will slow both slow down the traffic, which is a problem there. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. and I, I think we need a light. Okay. Sounds like it needs to be addressed in the plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just to add another couple of comments from John, um, I think that he would also probably say a light because he did say more traffic signals and pedestrian striping as well as well as um, monument history signs and sitting areas for, sep um, for separate neighborhoods as well. Thank you, John. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Lex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my initial re uh, response to traffic enforcement, speeding traffic signals. Um, yeah, I think it would be, it sounds like, I agree, it sounds like we should articulate a strategy that talks about traffic control, s slowing down speeds um, and, and traffic devices, mm -hmm. um, preferably traffic lighting signals, um, and maybe, and knowing that these things can be expensive public improvements, it doesn't mean that we can't do some mitigation in between now and then. I mean, you could still introduce stripings or signs or temporary control devices, increase enforcement. So we can definitely articulate a strategy to speak to that concern. Hey, to make sure that's in plan. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, something has to be said, like, like our teenagers literally use that as a raceway. Yeah. Uh, because there is no stop signs, because there yeah. are no stop lights. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to the points that have been made, but every time I drive down that street, I get passed constantly. It, yeah. it, it's a raceway. Oh, it, yeah. It's being used the as a raceway. And we know our teenagers love to have their raceway, right? But that, that's really dangerous in that particular part of town. And I, I'm not sure it's just the teenagers. I see grown men and they're driving their trucks, their cars, and they're racing car to car, truck to truck. And I'm thinking, how would I, as a, a, a mother with children, try and cross that street safely? Yeah. This is good. Hello, Thank you, Ms. Abby, as well. Yeah. Um, like I well, mentioned, uh, in yeah, the previous no. call, there's not a crosswalk from Allen Hamill, or actually cleared down by local liquor, all the way up to Mesa. Mm -hmm. So there's one. There's one at Ilex, uh, that's it. And it's only on one side of the intersection there. And I see people out in the middle of the street all the time out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, Alan? Yes, sir. That's Rick. Right. Yeah, one of the things we talk about traffic, and, and one of the things that a lot of people haven't identified is East Northern. Um, you come into the area after Santa Fe Drive, going east on to where Egan, Bowman, and Marin and them all are, and people fly through East Northern there, coming to, going into the Bland, and, and would turn off, that you're coming to north, uh, Northern to take a lap, say, on Marin. I mean, you're, sometimes you're, you're, uh, you're, you know, people are flying by. I've seen so many accidents there where people have hit each other on, on that, and uh, they'll wait to turn. Uh, they're flying down northern. So there's so many accident potentials going on them turnoffs to go to Egan and Marin because those are the two that go, uh, they would yeah. go north again. Uh, 
but uh, people fly through down east nor uh, northern there through the uh, through the residential area there and yeah. to take any left turn to go toward Bojan town towards say the uh, even on Marin for uh, the restaurant down there we're marking them on it's almost an accident happening all the time there on that left hand turn because people won't go to the right on the CFNI fence line they'll stay right behind you and almost force you uh, to turn uh, so I don't know if there's something they can do on East Northern too to slow traffic uh, going into the neighborhood because uh, that's a bad and, and there's an accident waiting to happen in them areas there are those turn lanes the, to turn to the residential areas. Okay. And Thank you. Thanks. Sharon. Following uh, Rick's comments and, and also the others, if we are interested in the preservation and, and connectivity and the cultural aspects of the neighborhoods, we need to slow the traffic down so people can appreciate. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. Good point. All right. Um, how about any other? Now I'm sure there's so many other ideas. Um, let me let me briefly acknowledge some of the feedback that I heard early on, just really briefly. Um, so um, there was some like Lexi had talked about. Um, actually, those that's just corrections for the flyer. Never mind. <laughs> Look at the wrong thing. Um, let's see. Actually, you know what? I'm looking at something that was like feedback for the uh, technical copy of the plan. That doesn't really pertain to what we're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> I just realized that. Let me jump in. Go ahead, Bart. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> so I know I don't get to be here much, and I'm really happy that I get to be here today. I want to reinforce Rick's comments. I think that's super important. Um, we probably at NeighborWorks get a request every month, well, probably every two months or so from police departments wanting to utilize our cameras for the accidents at Route Northern, which is one of the last places that have stoplights as you're going east. <clears throat> the speeds literally pick up from there. So wow. he is absolutely right. It is literally dangerous trying to turn left or even right onto, onto Northern right there. Um, so yeah, if, if we wanna like impact how people are viewing it as well, but also mm -hmm. just the safety of folks, absolutely have to figure out how to slow down the speeds on Northern. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I hope also with the beatification of all the neighborhoods that uh, are, are um, I don't know if we have a department such as weed control, <laughs> trash control, that would really help, especially. Well, we, and that's a, oh, I don't know if I should say anything. Um, well, well, you, you know, the city of Colorado Springs, I'm sorry, the city of Colorado Springs, Parks and mm -hmm. Rec, they definitely take care of all that stuff. I used to work for them and uh, they're diligent in mm -hmm. all that. Well, see, there is, um, one, of the, one of the future elements that we really do need to explore is, and it's, it's almost more of a little bit farther down the road, but it reflects exactly what Alexi is, is working on is that the, the, the neighborhood unit of planning, uh, these neighborhood plans, there's, a, there's something that we don't talk about because it, you know, it's, it's the fact that once you have neighborhoods, you can get together and do improvements through bonding and, and various programs that are already written up and ready to go, but it really just it needs a lot of cooperation from your neighbors to do. You know, and, and right now we're just, and this is throughout America, you know, we wait for federal dollars, you know, we wait for special grants and different programs and, you know, but there's nothing that says, you know, we can't just raise money as a neighborhood for improvements that we want in our neighborhoods. 
does that include the alpha beta plant the alpha beta plant that they're redoing because the, that's where the majority of the the, the weeds are back in there <laughs> we should know that <laughs> no well that's private but it's more that would be more for sidewalks and streets because sidewalks actually fund, fall under the previ of the individual property owners right um and there's there there is it's written in the code basically that if uh, your sidewalks are bad, then your neighbor can tell the city that your sidewalks are bad, and the city can will fix your sidewalks if you can't, and then put a lien on your house. But the city can does not have the money to fix the sidewalks, or I guess a a certain and, and the city's not interested in making people homeless either. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, don't try to scare people. A lien on your house no. for three thousand dollars when you sell it in ten years is not. Not going to make you homeless, Alan. Okay, sorry. sorry for scaring. Our, <laughs> sorry for scaring you, everyone. <laughs> All right, I misspoke. Yeah. <laughs> you know but, more. But we uh, we don't have the. But the city doesn't have a fund for you know just sitting around like to go fix all the sidewalks. Yeah. But it's written in the code that that's the process. Yeah, I guess it's better to say that the city doesn't want to take a um, uh, like an does not want to take an approach that would be um, what's the word. Um, attacking or you know um, perceived as yeah ag too aggressive. It, that, that's the way but, I understand it. But the way I understand is we don't have money to do it. Right. Um, and and to f and to follow up is to Miss Abby's original point about maintenance of weeds and and um, it's just think of it like this: if if there's a public improvement um, that is outside someone's private property, such as a sidewalk or 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 a lawn. Um, or a tree, uh, that if it if it abuts the private property, then the private property owner is responsible for maintaining it or repairing it. Um, but then when you talk about areas that are, do not abut private property, such as medians, road medians, or areas that abut parks, that's where the parks department actually does do maintenance of the trees or the or the plants there. Um, only if it does not abut private property. So you might see some areas that are well maintained, um, and some areas that aren't. And it just depends on who whose whose private property abuts it, or maybe the parks department is just, just not hasn't gotten that yet in their maintenance cycle, and then just, just call them and they will make sure to do that. May uh, may I ask the question? Uh, there was a battle at at the point of this new revitalization uh, cul-de-sac between the state and the city. Did the city take over it now? That was a good yeah. Thank you for good bringing question. that. I actually wrote a note here uh, with a question mark about CDOT maintenance. So I was going to just uh, make some inquiries and see who's responsible for the maintenance, or at least the. Especially if it's you know these are recent these are newer public improvements so there's got to be some kind of performance guarantee about the maintenance. Of these I, things. I called I called C dot director. I made sure that he came. He did a, he did do a major repair on it uh, after I spoke with him. And then they also send a person maybe once every two weeks to weed, which is great. But mm -hmm. my goodness, the wind blows so badly in this area that trash just accumulates there and I don't mind doing it but it's the landscaping that I'm concerned about they still haven't completed you know getting rid of the ugly under plastic and covering it properly right so uh, yeah land it's like landscape performance maintenance yeah yeah, yeah. I believe installation with CDOT and maintenance uh, maybe the water maintenance, so the water is the city, but I, 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 would, I don't know for certain. We'll see if we can just figure out who's responsible for the maintenance of the landscaping along the way. And, and you know, maybe articulate that as a strategy in the plan about, because I, I think that comes up a lot, maintenance of, mm -hmm. of plants, including like streetscape plants. Mm -hmm. That We've heard that come up a lot in, in other places in the city, so maybe it's good to acknowledge that in the plan as a strategy. What can we do to like be more proactive about it and to make sure that if, if it doesn't belong to a person, if it's a city authority or, or some state authority, then how can we make them more act proactive or more responsive? So that sounds like a strategy. Or they can pay me off. off they can pay me <laughs> off the side and I'll weed clean every week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
What's the name of the cul de sac? <laughs> that's a really team. great point because if you drive down from Pueblo Boulevard down Northern Avenue, there are beautiful plants in the median, which are taken care of by the city. And then as you get towards the Bessemer area, they disappear. Mm. There, there <laughs> are some actually city owned pieces of land that are not as well maintained in this particular area. I, and that that's legitimate. I, that's absolutely speaking to her point. I brought that up with Lexi too about East Northern. They've neglected the, they don't plant flowers on East, East Northern either. I don't know why. It's just You're talking about the streetscape, like the planners, the streetscape planners, like because on West Northern there's the streetscape planters with the flowers. Right, is that what you're talking about? Well, the planters are supposed to be maintained by the city, the ones that are on Northern, but not even just the planters. Like literally, if you just drive from Pueblo Boulevard down Northern Avenue, you will yeah. see trees and flowers and plants in the median. And as you start coming into Bessemer, that dissipates and starts becoming less and less taken care of. And then, yeah, also along Northern, I know the city is supposed to be maintaining those planters and I regularly clean those up because they have bottles of liquor in them, mm -hmm. trash in them. Um, nobody else maintains that. And it's not actually supposed to be neighbor works on the ones that are ours, because that is supposed to be maintained by the city. All right. Um, yeah, because that comes up from time to time about, because I know streetscapes, some streetscapes are, there's, they're maintained as projects. So um, that's another thing I should look into and see if, how, what's the process for, again, like that goes back to the strategy you're, you're formulating how do we make authorities more responsive to maintenance of public improvements? That's the strategy I'm hearing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What's that, Paul? Streetscapes could have a sponsor as well. Like downtown mm -hmm. on B Street, Concilius, like sponsor these flower um, planters, right, you know, down on B Street, right from B Street Cafe and all that stuff. And they look great. And, you know, I don't think, you know, once they're up, probably the sponsorship doesn't amount to too much, but it's good advertising for businesses in the area and it makes everything look nice. Yeah, that's a good point. Great idea, Paul, yes. <clears throat> so we can alternate, alter the beautification, you know, when we talk about beautification, we can also add through mm -hmm. sponsorship. Too. Yeah. yeah. Well, these, and these all hammer down into the actual strategies of how we get from a plan to actually having those, those things. Yeah. Because we can all wait for the money to show up, you know, forever. Well, like, but we can be like more Santa proactive. Fe, yeah, like on Santa Fe, there's boxes. It would be a natural for them to put flowers and different stuff right up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, going back to any, any other, I'm um, thinking about back to the plan in general and um, going think, again, thinking about the three themes, what else? What else is on your mind about um, how we are articulating this plan, and what else can we do to improve this, the language of the strategies in the plan? Is there anything else on your mind tonight about that? I will just say this: the reason that I came tonight was because I wanted to hear all of this. I know that our grant funding from the state to do part of this is going to be um, sort of ending a little bit because of COVID and the situations that have had to come up through reallocating budgets. Um, but there is a real importance to this plan being in place because there isn't just city money at stake. There is state money allocations that we can look to. There is a lot of things that we can look to. Um, and having this plan in place is going to be sort of the key to being able to go through and go to those funding applications. Um, so I wanted to hear from you guys. I wanted to hear what was happening. 
I think NeighborWorks is primed and ready to try to help in those situations. Um, and so we're trying to hear, what is that plan gonna be? How can we align ourselves properly for that? Um, and so anything you guys can say to me um, and anything that we can help with while Renee is still fully on it and Lexi will be um, is really important right now. Mm, yeah. And I, and I do, when I've participated in the begin work group and I've seen the work of Renee and, and Lexi as, as people who are facilitating, uh, you know, this, this grant project from the health department and, and facilitating, you know, this plan, you know, getting this plan to the neighborhoods, I think they've done a lot of great work and have been really integral to this whole process. So, um, and, I, and I do feel like we're, we're reaching the home stretch as far as this plan goes to get it a, a formally adopted to your point to support, to justify uh, not just local but state and federal funding for projects. So I, I, I'm glad you see that as well, Ashley. Yeah. Any other when thoughts you, from the group about, uh, yeah, Ms. Abby? Sorry, just a question. Um, when you talked about co-ops, neighborhood co-ops, would that be uh, perhaps getting um, here into the Grove and I'm sure up into Bojan and Bessemer area, uh, uh, the, the markets of, from the county, you know, the fruit and the vegetables mm -hmm. once, yeah, yeah. once a month or once or twice a month, it would be so ideal to have fresh fruit available within walking distance right. in the neighborhood. That's the, uh, and just for clarification, the, the, the way the co-op works is that essentially the neighborhood invests in the infrastructure for a market, so let's say toilet paper, you know, vegetables or something like that, and then it's, it's all um, gathered in, in business basically, but the business is a co-op where you know you're investing in the business, and I could I, I, am I I might be off. I don't think I'm off because I've used co-op before. No, I think what I'm I'm hearing from Bart, and, and I'm going to bring it back to you, yeah. Bart. Just it sounds like Bart is speaking from personal uh, experience of what you've seen yeah. of different co-ops, and I think this is one form, one potential yeah. form. But yeah. go ahead and share. That's an interesting idea. Well, yeah. So whereas um, basically the neighborhood comes together and says, hey, we all need you know, we all need milk, cheese, you know, butter, toilet paper, you know, and we need a place we can buy it in the neighborhood. A little market. A little market, and then so they invest in the, basically the the capital to get the market going. It's managed as a co-op, so someone's managing it, but it's a, I, I believe you get return on the investment if you invest in it. Yeah, that, that's, that's one way of looking at it, yeah. you know. And that's kind of what we broadly speak about. We've talked about that as far back as the Bessemer plan as well, like having food co-ops or, mm -hmm. but it, it would be maybe, maybe it's be helpful to be more specific in what we mean by co-ops. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's an experience from Switzerland where all the grocery stores are co-ops, basically that I, that I saw. Yeah. They just say, they call it the co-op. And, and maybe, you know, I think Renee, you, you're, you are pretty close to the food, public food project. Is that right? Yeah, I'm on their council. You want to tell, share, you want to kind of, for those who are on the call who um, would like to learn more how that works and how that's affecting neighborhoods, um, you want to just briefly talk about that with us? Yeah, so <clears throat> we started the food council, or the food council started about a year, or a little over a year ago. Um, and, you know, it was to bring farmers and producers and um, production and, and restaurant tours all together to buy our local food, everything local. How would we get out there? How do we market it? All of that. Well, then COVID hit and we kind of took a little bit of a turn. So we have been getting grants and things like that to buy cows for um, protein for people um, who are in need. And I, I just want to say that the Public Food Project is open to everybody. It's, it's open if anybody ever wants to come into any of our meetings. Um, and it's the third Tuesday of every month. And if you want to get on the mailing list, um, you can contact me or um, 
Monique Marez or even Linda Tremley. Um, and then we can tell you when the meetings are going to be and all of that. Cool. Thank but they, you. But they are working very hard. I'm so sorry, Alan. They're even very hard oh, to get yeah, food back into the community as we just put in three edible gardens around town Mineral Palace. Um, oh, sugar. I can't remember the other two. But so people can just come up and actually take food, you know, and they're working to try to get the greenhouse going again and all of that. So, um, Renee, so if I could get my landlord to uh, donate uh, some of his land would you be able to do a, an edible garden in in this area in the grove um not this year but we could probably next year and, and so and is that anything <laughs> uh what he was saying about getting a investment return I'm, I'm just curious just so i would have information to give to my landlord so that's two different things miss abby um uh, what Bart was talking about was a model of uh, co-ops where it involves uh, capital uh, right. from the neighborhood and an investment okay. return model. That's a, which country was that? Switzerland? Switzerland is yeah. the one I, I use. And, and Renee was talking about a, a different type of model um, which is involving, that is an active here in Pueblo, which involves producers and uh, vendors and, and all the stakeholders who grow the food, make the food, you know, sell the food, all getting together on ideas and how to bring food into communities, into neighborhoods through targeted interventions, yep. such as community gardens or, or, or small markets. But and both, they just started. But yeah. both ideas don't have to be mutually exclusive. Right. They, there is definite uh, opportunity within both. Yeah. So maybe, who knows, maybe the Grove will at some point say, you know what, we got enough, figure, we can figure it out. We can do like a cat, like a, the, what if the Grove, did like an investment type co-op where, you know, that that's possible, you know, it's just, just put your minds to it, you know. Um, and Al Alexi had a question or raised her hand a minute, a minute ago. I just kind of wanted to add that there probably are some opportunities that, you know, you could look into. So just that question of, you know, if you could find the land, how could you start like an edible landscaping piece um, through the health department uh, mm -hmm. our, grant, our grants ending, so we'll have to see what budget looks like, but there are like mini grants that are available through our program too, or, um, you know, there, there's uh, a couple larger grants that are being written so that possibly that could be something that's funded in the future. Um, so I would, I, I'll put my contact information into the chat too, that way you and I can chat offline because I think that there are probably some easy and quick ways to get some edible landscaping into the area if, you know, people have the desire to put that there and, and want to put the effort in, either through awesome. my grant or if not, a different one. So I'll put Thank that in there. Mm -hmm. Good. See, sorry, you're sparking ideas that could come to fruition. Um, and closing, closing stuff? I, 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 um, I, I, I just want to encourage those listening here in the call or those watching in the near future just to, again, give us more of your comments. We hope to get all the comments by July 22nd. So there's plenty of time between now and then to get more ideas, more comments. And then after that date, we'll, we, we, we will, here in the planning department, revise uh, the plan according to all the comments we've gotten and then put it back out for another round of comments with that planning and zoning commission uh, yeah. review. Oh, okay, with the, I was going to say I don't. I know that they won't. Well, I don't. I didn't get the impression that after these comments, yeah. there may be comments on the final plan, but these comments are supposed to go in the final plan. Yes, yes, yeah. But, I'm, okay. just, I'm confused. It's, it's all part of the public. The public process. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the 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 majority, the substance of the hard work that we're doing is now, and then. But things become a matter of formality when you bring it to the Planning and Zoning Commission because typically True. we strive to do all the hard work up front to make it easier for the, our commissioners to really just say, oh, this is a good idea. I want to recommend approval of this. But, but it's still a public process, so mm -hmm. there will be other opportunities True. for people to always say, hey, there's this one more thing I want to adjust, and, then, and that's, all, that's doable all the way up to the city council meeting. So That is correct. Yeah. 
But please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get your comments before <laughs> if you can start. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's more it's more efficient to get all this figured out in advance. Yes, thank you, Bart. Bart is advocating a good use of taxpayer dollars. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any other well, any other thoughts on the call here, Rick? It looked like you had a thought, Rick. No, I'm fine. You good? Okay. It looks a concluding anyone? meeting like this. Oh. Uh, Ms. Abby, you had a question? Will there be a concluding meeting similar to this, after, you know, right before July 22nd, you know, after the surveys have been filled out, et cetera, et cetera? I think, I think there'll be opportunities, to, at least to the neighborhood associations. I know the Grove is getting their, I hope, I hope that the Grove the Gap gets together again. I think that would be good for them to, to discuss. Uh, the Begin Work Group that Lexi works with, that's also a good for them to briefly touch upon things. Uh, Rick, you got your hand up. Uh, just one question, Helen, on the survey. Uh, I had yep. some people tell me that they actually went in and did the survey already. That survey's up and ready to go, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good, because yeah. I didn't know if they were getting kicked out or not. But mm -hmm. good. So that that so their stuff's already been yep. answered once there's they a, did it. Good. There's a there's a typo in the survey. I think it says that like it, it when you go to the survey it says please do the survey before June something. And so that's, and that's why I was confused about that. Uh, oh, yeah, I I'll, I'll look into that. Too. Okay. And, uh, 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 I just wanted to say the group will have one more neighborhood meeting before July 22nd. And for Abby, we have a Grove neighborhood um, association it's called Gap Grove Area Partnership. And it meets at the Blowback Gallery on the second Thursday of every month at 5.30 in the evening. Second Tuesday at 5.30? Second Thursday. Thursday at the art gallery. Cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I, I guess the last thing I'll say, uh, what you can expect going forward, because uh, as, as we get all the comments, be, you know, before July, basically we'll take all the comments, we'll take the prioritization from the survey um, we will include all of those as an appendix mm -hmm. to the plan itself and where we can fit some more stuff into the plan from the comments, we will put into the plan and we will also show which is the highest priorities. So that, that, I, I think that's what you can expect. Yeah, that way it shows that we, you know, we're listening and responding in a true public process. Any other? I was going to say more or less what you're saying is none of the comments will be lost. If it's not in the plan exactly where we see it, it'll be in an right. appendix yeah. where it still does have that wording there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Any other thoughts tonight from anyone? Looks like I got one last like thing. Good. Yes, sir, Rick. <laughs> Just on the, you told, said that you guys had mailed the flyers out uh, to the neighborhoods. You, or, or, cards. Yeah, the postcards. postcards. Are people going to be getting them probably this week? They'll start seeing them in the mail. Is that correct? We were hoping that they would have seen them earlier this week. Because have I haven't seen, seen any one, yet. I, I haven't seen, seen anything one in my mail. Mm, okay. Yeah, they they got sent out last week, so we thought they'd be up on Monday. Tuesday. And we can modify the website to, if they don't, if we know that they didn't, if they didn't reach out, then we can set up another meeting for after when they've gotten out before J July 31st. But we can put that on the website and we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So for, for those on this call, just let us know if, if if you get postcards, tell us what date you receive those postcards because that might indicate, you know, if if they if they got out late, then. Which, which is in reference to this meeting, then we might, it might necessitate a uh, uh, follow-up action. Yep. Yeah. Assuming yeah, they, they I go to the website. I haven't got one yet. Mm, okay. okay. But if they don't go, uh, the, the key is if they go to the website and we do have a new meeting for them yeah. and the survey, then uh, I think we're still within the bounds of due yeah. diligence, hopefully. Yeah. It, maybe as a backup plan, maybe we can encourage people to go to the neighborhood meetings gap yeah, you know, or maybe band could have another, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, let me know, Rick. Shoot me a text when you get it in the mail. Because you should. Oh, yeah, because as of today, I didn't get it left, so I, I, I you know, because yeah. I didn't know shoot, when they were coming. Shoot me a text when you do, and I'll let okay. you guys know, okay? 
Okay. okay. And, and that goes for Paul and Miss Abby. Let yes. us know if, when you get those post, what date you receive those postcards. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. Thank That'll you. help us verify. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, yeah, I'm good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> 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 Uh, I've been Alan's a pleasure. finally ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've had three. This is my third virtual meeting today. <laughs> but it's been great. We've been doing great work all day, so all, all night. <laughs> so it's good It's good to, that you'll spend your time with us tonight. And uh, it's good to see your faces again. And, and always a pleasure. And, and at Miss Abby, I hope to see you in person, too, at maybe one of the GAP meetings. Most all right? Definitely. I'll be at the next That's one. Good. Thank you. Great. Uh, you all have a good night. Thank, right, you. thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, guys. I know.